On October the 15th, in 1954, Hurricane Hazel left a dramatic trail of damage and loss of life in Toronto and elsewhere in Ontario. The Humber River took the brunt of the storm. Streets and bridges were lost. An estimated 300 million tons of rain fell in Toronto. 83 people died. On Wednesday, October the 15th, 2014, at the annual Hurricane Hazel Heritage Talk on the 60th anniversary of this tragic event, David Phillips, senior climatologist, presented a talk looking back to Hurricane Hazel that provided new insights into an event that resides in our memory and engages so many Torontonians. What follows is the talk in its entirety recorded that evening. We hope that you enjoy this informative and thought-provoking presentation discussing and dissecting the impact of Hurricane Hazel and climate change in the ensuing years. Sixty years later, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a man highly respected in a more modern version of, of the field, David Brooks, <coughs> Senior Climatologist with Environment Canada's Weather Service. Sixty years ago, on this hour, outside this historic building, the rains had let up. The winds had begun to slacken. Uh, temperature was like it was today, fairly mild, 16, 17 degrees. Earlier in the day, uh, meteorologists had downgraded Hurricane Hazel to Storm Hazel. And, uh, and people thought, oh my gosh, just another wet Friday, another wet weekend. Some went bowling, some went to the movies, others went to bed. No sense at all about what was to, to happen. And yet the worst was, was yet to come. And so tonight, what I'd like to do is to relive that time to try to explain to you from a meteorological point of view and the significance of what really happened meteorologically during that, uh, of that event. Now, where I'm going to, to take you is, um, is through a little bit, I have to sort of introduce you to a little bit of meteorology. So we're going to talk about tropical storms, the definitions, the life cycle of what a, a, a tropical storm or hurricane is. We're going to look at, because very few hurricanes come into Canada. We have, um, you know, um, for example, in Newfoundland, one of the stormiest areas of Canada, you only get one hurricane every 12 years, you see, that makes land. <coughs> So they're very, actually, they're not really common phenomena here in the, in the Great White North. And so what happens to them? Well, they become uh, post-tropical depressions. Sounds like a psychological ailment coming back in Florida, you know? But hey, they transform themselves, but they still have the force and the power of a, of a tropical uh, system, but they just have a little different characteristic, a little different personality than the, the hurricane. Then we're going to look at Hazel, its birth, its track, and, uh, and of course how it transitioned to one of these uh, post-tropical depressions. What was life like? What was going on in the weather office at Malton? Was there a lot of drama? Was there people screaming and yelling at each other? Or, or what took place with regards to providing that forecast that Madeline talked about Fred Turnbull, who was providing information to as many people as he could possibly do? We'll look at the storm rainfall, the runoff, and very little of the impacts. I know that you know most about the impacts, and I'm not going to dwell on that painful area of this uh, particular uh, storm. And then, of course, the lessons learned, and, and if time permits, a little comment maybe about climate change and, and hurricanes. And throughout this, I'll, I'll throw in a little trivia, because I, I like to entertain people as much as to inform them. So I hope there's not too much trivia to get your minds wandering, but. Uh, Hey, I can't, I can't help it. So let's, uh, let's look at, um, at really the, the, what we do is we classify these, uh, uh, these tropical storms. Well, we call them in, the, um, uh, in our particular basin, in the Atlantic area, uh, we call them hurricanes. Uh, east of the International Dateline, they're also called hurricanes uh, over here. In fact, they get, this area gets more hurricanes than the North Atlantic. Uh, over here in the, uh, the, the China Sea, uh, they're called typhoons, uh, meaning uh, 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 great wind. Uh, uh, they're, they're typhoons. In the Bay of Bengal in India, the, south, uh, uh, the s southern Indian Ocean, they're called severe cyclones. 
and around Australia also called a severe cyclone. Whatever you call them, doesn't matter. These are the monster storms, the greatest storms on Earth are really in hurricanes. Not in terms of the wind speed. Tornadoes can be much higher. But in terms of the, the, the area and the force, the rain and the winds that, that they contain, they are really monster storms. The United Nations World Meteorological Organization estimates that there are about 85 tropical storms around the world in an average year. And um, uh, causing billions of dollars of damage and, and also lots of deaths. But very interesting, the number of deaths have really gone down. You know, 30 years ago, I would describe to you, probably 100,000 people die every year from hurricanes. Now, 20 years ago, it would be bound to about maybe 20,000. Now, it tends to be more like 1,000. And it's because the forecasting has got better, but more so, people value life more. And even in some of the areas like Bangladesh and India and Burma, uh, they have set up emergency measures and there are shelters for people to go. The fact they know three or four days in advance that the, the hurricane is coming and they're able to provide that, uh, uh, that, uh, that information and get people out of harm's way. Now let's look at the North Atlantic. Uh, this area, um, sorry, uh, this area here, got to make sure I get that, uh, we're off the, the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico here. Now, so if I was a forecaster in the Miami at the National Hurricane Center, I'd be looking out of this water uh, uh, probably from June 1st to the end of November, or probably start earlier in May because, hey, the season starts on June 1st, but you can still have uh, hurricanes in May. They can even go into December and even to January. But generally the season is from uh, uh, June 1st to November 30th, with the peak part of the season uh, being around September the 8th to October the 8th. That's, that's the, uh, the, the peak activity period. So if I was looking out there in the, in the ocean, because you know, all, all hurricanes begin as a thunderstorm. Just a garden variety kind of thunderstorm out there, and then it kind of grows and stays together, and then there are thousands of thunderstorms out there, but only about 11 make it to tropical storms, only about six make it to hurricanes in the North Atlantic, and maybe two have, have eligibility to the Hall of Fame in terms of a, of a nasty kind of a, of a hurricane. So, um, so what they do is they look out there and they say, oh gee, it looks like there's a little area of thunderstorms that are lasting more than a day. So they draw a little box around, a hot box, and they begin to say, well, we just watch that a little bit more. They wouldn't necessarily fly reconnaissance planes in it, but they would just take a look at it, let's watch it in six hours from now or 24 hours, what does it do? So they call it a tropical disturbance. And then they look again, they wait for the next time, and they say, oh my gosh, this area has begun to get organized a little bit. It's beginning to kind of circulate, rotate a little bit, and the winds have picked up from about there now in excess of 37 kilometers per hour. So we'll call it a tropical depression, you see. Keep watching it, monitoring it, and get models uh, focused on it so they can see if this thing is going to develop. And then time goes on, maybe two or, two or three days, and all of a sudden the thing has blossomed into a tropical storm. So winds are now, and this is the winds are the criteria as to whether you grow it from a depression to a tropical storm to, to a, eventually a hurricane. So if the winds get above 60, uh, 62 uh, uh, kilometers, 62 kilometers per hour above that, then it's considered to be um, a tropical storm. And it's given a name. And so it now inherits this name, that name stays with it, and of course, they now monitor it a little bit closer. It's beginning to move, a little bit more organized. It's growing in strength in terms of the other uh, wind. Now, let me, let me talk a little bit about naming storms. That's something that you, this is where my first little trivia business comes in. Now, in, before 1950, they would name hurricanes at the forecasting center in Miami after girlfriends or uh, probably mothers in law. I think more than anything, actually. <laughs> but they could be after a president. There was a, a Hurricane uh, Harry, after Harry Truman. And there was another one, Hurricane Beth, his wife. In fact, it, she was a bigger one than Harry. And so there was a little bit of, uh, uh, of jealousy going on there in terms of the hurricane. They would sometimes name them after Saints' Days 
or when they developed on a day, or they would sometimes name them after the fact uh, that it sank a ship. So they would sometimes be given the name of the ship that they uh, sank. Often it was just latitude and longitude. Well, this hurricane at, uh, at 10 degrees north and uh, 15 uh, uh, degrees uh, east uh, and is merging with another system and there would be three or four out there time people get all confused about all these latitudes and longitudes changing every minute of the day. So in 1950, they said, all right, let's forget this, uh, this our, our sort of arbitrary system of naming them. We'll name them after the Greek, uh, after the, um, the phonetic alphabet. So Abel, Baker, Charlie were the names given to these uh, systems. Then in 1953, and there's no reason given why, they started naming them after female names. So in that first year of 1953, you had Alice, Barbara, Barbara Carol, Dolly, Edna, Florence, Gail, and Hazel. Hazel was a hurricane in 1953. And so then in 1954, they repeated the list, including Hazel. Now the only one that was changed for no reason, they had um, uh, the uh, Gail became Gilda. <laughs> Gail was just, wasn't even a, it was like a fish store. It just died out there in the Pacific or in the Atlantic. So they, but why it, it changed names, I don't know. Maybe somebody complained. But what I found that was kind of interesting that was after Carol in 1954, it was a major hurricane, caused 61 deaths in the United States, and uh, uh, was a, a major hurricane that 54 season. Uh, a woman wrote to the weather office in Canada, and here's what she asked. She said, "I wish to enter a protest about naming hurricanes after females." Everyone knows that men are bigger blows than women. <laughs> I feel that it is an insult to what is generally considered as the weaker sex to give a feminine name to such a rambunctious, destructive, altogether obnoxious display of elemental fury. <laughs> Why not name the next one Elmer or Ivan the Terrible or something similar? Certainly nothing could be more inappropriate than Dolly for instance, which name immediately conjures up in my mind a little fluffy-haired, blue-eyed, demure blonde, scared of a mouse and who couldn't hurt a flea. Where are these things named anyway? Is it in Ottawa? You <laughs> had that right, didn't you? <laughs> Trusting you will take appropriate steps to have the matter rectified in the near future. I remain da 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 Well, 25 years later, somebody must have paid attention to her <laughs> because they decided in 1978, for the season of 1979, to name them male-female names. So male-female, male-female, and the next year, female-male, female-male. <laughs> and that was, uh, there were six lists uh, published, and so that every, every uh, so six years from now, to see the same list repeated for the North Atlantic. Now, it's a different system in other basins. Sometimes they name after flowers or animals, but our system there is, is named um, in, the, in the North Atlantic, um, as, as those uh, names. Now there are, in fact, um, 21 names chosen. There's no names for, uh, for Q, U, X, Y, and Z. So if your name was Yolanda or, or uh, Zelda or, or Zach, you couldn't have a hurricane named after you. But in, 19, in 2005, the very first time, they had more than 21 hurricanes. And so they thought, oh, what will we do here? So what they did, and they had apparently a footnote in that list of instructions, you say. They said, what we will do is we will name them after letters of the Greek alphabet. So as soon as a Wilma was uh, spent, the next one became Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Omega. And it's the only time where there's ever been more than 21 uh, hurricanes. Now hurricanes sometimes are retired. It's retired if it's a nasty blow, if it kills a lot of people, does a lot of destruction in terms of the uh, buildings and materials and property, and, uh, or there's something meteorological significant about it. And the only time that Canada has ever had lobbied to have a hurricane retired was Hurricane Juan, because it was an interesting, it was the, 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 it was the strongest hurricane to make landfall in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, uh, in about um, 100 years and took down a hundred million trees. So it was, it didn't kill, kill seven people, but it wasn't from that point of view, it was the fact that it was meteorological significant in that area, and so it was, uh, it was in fact retired. 
Uh, so between 1979 and 2013, there have been uh, uh, 53 hurricanes retired. Uh, 31 males and 22 females. <laughs> I'll let you draw any conclusions. <laughs> now there's only been one hurricane retired twice. And that was Hazel. Hazel was retired because of the damage it did in 1954. And there was a hurricane in the eastern Pacific that was called Hazel, and it was retired in 1965. So Hazel has a distinction of, uh, of that. So hey, let's get on with the action here. So we go from tropical storms, and you see we then come to um, what we, um, we call a hurricane. And a hurricane is that tropical storm is upgraded to a hurricane if in fact the winds exceed 118 kilometers per hour. And so it's given, it retains its name, but it is in fact now goes from a tropical storm to actually um, a hurricane. Now there are five sort of classes of, um, of hurricanes. Um, in fact, so what we do here is we look at categories one, two, three, four, and five. All driven by the wind speeds. So as the wind speed increases, the category increases. The amount of precipitation doesn't matter whether it's a tropical depression or a category five, could still be the same amount of precipitation. It doesn't really matter the kind of hurricane uh, uh, or even the storm surge. The storm surges generally go up as the, as the power of the hurricane, but it's strictly driven by, uh, by wind speed. Now what we're talking about wind speed here, we're talking about surface winds. We're, not talk we're talking about surface winds, it'd be about a 10 meter pole is where the wind observations are taken around the world. And so whatever that wind speed is at that 10 meter point, then that is what determines whether it's going to be a category one, two, three, four, or five. If it goes from three, four, and five, it's what is referred to as a super uh, hurricane or a super um, typhoon. Uh, because it's considered to be, uh, the damage from it could be, could be incredible. So uh, the wind speeds, now if you're in an in a apartment building in Miami and your wind speed, you could be a category one at the surface, but if you're living on the 47th floor, it could be a category three in terms of the kind of damage because the higher you go up, the stronger the winds would, uh, uh, would be. Now in terms of the, of the storm surge, this is the wall of water that often precedes the hurricane. And it is driven by two things. One is the pressure. With lower pressure, it allows the water of the ocean to rise. And but about 25% it is affected by pressure. But generally it is the strong winds, the winds that are pushing down on that water and driving that wall of water uh, uh, to the surface. And in North America, it's the storm surge that causes most of the damage. It's the erosion, the, the water that inundates the shoreline and goes you know, maybe a kilometer in, do in, 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 uh, in shore. So, so it's the, the, the storm surge is very, very important. It also depends upon the speed of the storm, the size of the storm surge, the angle at the coast at which it comes, and also the kind of seabed. If it's very shallow water, then the wall of water can build up quite high and create this, this monster kind of wave that comes into the, uh, uh, the area. Uh, of course, you can get also heavy rains. Again, it doesn't matter which system we're talking about. It could be 200 millimeters of rain, 250, 300, it, it, uh, whatever the system. And then, of course, we also see tornadoes within hurricanes. Uh, because when the winds come across shore, particularly, they begin to kind of uh, compete and, and you get this kind of different, uh, different flow and you can have uh, tornadoes spawned by, uh, by hurricanes uh, in, in an area. Now, one of the most interesting aspects of the, of the hurricane is the eye, that sort of interior. You don't have other storms, don't have eyes. Hurricanes have eyes or cores or, or hearts of the system you find in that, uh, that particular uh, center. And of course, the, the thing that eye is often somewhere between 20 and 40 kilometers in diameter, uh, 20 and 40 kilometers in diameter. So it's not very big. And it can be a little larger, a little smaller, but generally 20 to 40 is the average. Now, it's a world of difference in that eye. When you think about these monster storms that occur just 40 kilometers away, in that eye, my gosh, it's like utopia. It's, it's warm. It's dry. The sun is out. There's blue sky, white puffy clouds. The air is still right in the center of that eye. And yet, just a short distance away, hell is broken out, you say. 
And so, so the eye is sort of an important kind of characteristic. And, uh, and what happens sometimes in that eye is there have been chips that have got into the eye and that have stayed at the same speed as the hurricane so they can ride it out until the hurricane just dies out. Or birds. Birds will fly in there. They've been defeathered. They've been battered and beaten up. And it's almost as if it's a, a chance to relax. And they'll just fly with the storm so that they don't get knocked uh, uh, if they enter the high wall. And of course, for a birder, this is, this is fabulous because you'll see, see birds that you've never seen in your lifetime that'll be blowing northward in a, in a, in a tropical storm or in, in a hurricane. So there are some advantages to, uh, to those uh, situations. Now, of course, in the eye wall, just a short distance away, you know, I mean, 15, uh, 15 kilometers up, is angry thunderstorms, deluges, uh, uh, powerful winds that could be over 300 kilometers per hour. It is absolutely um, uh, deadly and chaotic in that, uh, in that particular eye wall and extending out from it. They tend to come in spiral bands um, out from about maybe 400 kilometers from that eye or that eye wall is where you have the effects of winds are a little bit light, less, less so, a little bit less rain, but still pretty dangerous and powerful uh, uh, forces. Now, size doesn't mean anything with, uh, with hurricane, uh, hurricanes. Uh, hurricane Andrew in 92 was a very tiny one, but yet it was a Category 5. We can have bigger ones that are sprawling. Now, the only thing about bigger ones is that there's more misery to... to <coughs> you more experience more misery over a longer period of time. So if that storm takes its, its huge wide, well, it's still going to be raining and buffeting winds for a long period of time before the system moves, uh, moves away. Now, how do these things form? Okay, so, you know, most storms in our latitude form because the cold air dukes it out with the warm air. And it gives you un it's unstable situations, convective activity, and this is what drives the storms in our latitude in most areas away from the tropics. But in the tropics, it's a different kind of a formation. What it is, it's a, it's a, 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 a hurricane has a warm core, where a storm from in our latitude is what we call a cold core. You see, it's because you've got the warm air fighting it out with the cold air. And so in the warm core, what happens is the water evaporates from the ocean. As that moisture rises, the, 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 uh, as water vapor in, in, the, in the air, it gets to a point where it actually condenses and the, uh, the water vapor uh, forms into droplets of water and releases an enormous amount of heat, which is taken from the ocean uh, surface. So what you have is that you have very warm water at the, um, at the surface of the ocean, and the water is important to know what the water temperature is. Then you have the uh, sun uh, uh, cooking the, uh, the water temperatures, warming it up. You have the air um, uh, evaporating, the, the heat will evaporate the seawater. The air will rise, very moist and rising currents. Uh, uh, air is lighter, lower pressure, so it's rising. The air is rushing in from the sides to fill that vacuum. The air kind of continues to go up. And as it gets up, it's lighter than the surrounding air, and it continues to kind of buoyant and, and move up. And finally, it gets to the point where it's just about as cool as the surrounding air, and the water vapor condenses. And it releases an enormous amount of heat. And that just then fuels that air parcel a little bit more, and it, it, carries, it carries up. So it's that whole action of, uh, of air, of, of water evaporating, rising, condensing, releasing heat, that generates this chimney of, of warm core that is the, the thunderstorm that began innocuously as a calm kind of day that all of a sudden blows up into a day or two into a monster storm with, uh, uh, with a vortex whirlpool kind of a, a, a whirling weather machine that it is. Now, in order to have a tropical storm, there are a couple things that you need. First, you need, you need warm water. 26.5 uh, degrees. Anything below that is not warm enough. So 26.5, but more than that, you've got to have a deep warm water. Because if those winds stir up that surface water, it exposes cold air, it just cuts it off, you see. So you need about 50 meters to 100 meters of warm water, which is the perfect kind of breeding ground for these monster storms to, uh, uh, to develop. Now that's why you don't get the tropical storms or hurricanes in California or in British Columbia, because the water is too cold. You get a lot more uh, hurricanes down here in, um, in, in, the, in the eastern Pacific, 
uh, and hitting the Baja the California coast uh, of Mexico, a lot of them in Central America, but none of them can survive coming north to California or up to, um, up to British Columbia. Now occasionally, you will get a system that will come off of Asia, a typhoon, cross the international dateline, stay together, and maybe combine with another weather system. So it's kind of one of these, these uh, trans transformed kind of, of tornado or, or uh, hurricanes or typhoons. And then it will slam into, uh, into the west coast. And so Hurricane Frida back in 1962 was one of these. Killed seven people, did hundreds of millions of dollars in Victoria, Vancouver but was really just kind of a tropical typhoon, but with fronts and, and more mid-latitude characteristics. But hey, they called it a typhoon, they feel good about that they had a typhoon, and so you wouldn't want to deny them anything uh, uh, like that in, um, uh, in British Columbia. Is that an Eastern bias there now? <laughs> I'm talking about UFO clouds too, and, and there's another reason why you see a lot of those out there. But anyway, so another, another feature, is that you need some kind of a little thing that teases the water, kind of like a trigger, like a little bit of a of convergence, just sort of things are sitting there and you need sort of something to trigger it or to push it along the way. So sometimes that could be a, a spent front from another another system in the area. It um, it could be a system coming off of, of Africa, and I'll, I'll explain this in a, in a second. But notice how, what I want you to see is one thing. Look at how the the, the hurricanes, the, the formation, they come eastward here, many of them, and then they go northeastward. And that's an important point I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes. So you need kind of that pre, what I call pre-existing a disturbance to kind of get things going, you're saying. And one of the prime areas is near Africa in the Cape Verde area. A little tropical wave will come. Here is the high pressure area that's circulating like this and driving these storms in the northeast trades as they come across the Atlantic, warming up in the ocean waters, coming into the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and they're really developing into a nasty kind of a, of a storm. You also, of course, um, need warm, moist air. You need the stuff that starts a thunderstorm. We know what causes a thunderstorm, and so you kind of need that stuff too, you say. The other thing you need is you have to be away from the, from the equator. Because the Earth spins about 160, uh, 1,600 kilometers per hour. So there's this rotation of the Earth, and it imparts that energy to that system. And of course, it's the, what we call the Coriolis force, that apparent um, a kind of force of the rotating Earth. And it sort of spins around, and so if you're near the equator, the Coriolis is zero, or very low. If you're at the, up the poles, it's much higher. So you need this kind of a rotation to kind of get these things uh, a moving. And look at this, look at the equator. It's totally devoid of hurricanes. So you need to be about 500 kilometers to the north or the south of the equator to actually see this hotbed of breeding ground for these hurricanes uh, uh, to develop. The other thing you, you shouldn't have is, is what we call wind shear. That will kill a hurricane. So you don't want, you want winds to cooperate. You want them all moving in the same direction, the same speed as they move upwards in the column of air. So that's important. And then also, you kind of need what we call um, a high pressure area at the top. Here is this chimney, this air rushing into the surface, going up, and as it comes up about 15 kilometers, at the top, you're seeing this uh, a high pressure area that is actually perhaps maybe pushing down, creating this kind of outflow. And uh, so this is very important for the hurricane to get going and getting strong. And so you'd almost think that high pressure area might suffocate the, the hurricane. But no, it kind of complements, like sort of putting a fire in a chimney, and you get that air, those currents rising, and then you have to have some way of venting the top, and that's what the high pressure area does. So those are important elements. Now what will kill it will, of course, um, uh, will be land. If it crosses over land, it's like turning off the thermostat. It's, its fuel is gone. And so this will, in fact, uh, degrade it. Now this is what happened, this is Katrina, and what Katrina did was it, cr it crossed uh, as Category 1 to Florida, it came over Florida, over the land, it was downgraded less than a 1, and then it came over the other side, it picked up with warm water, came within an hour, was a Category 1, and within 9 hours had exploded from a 1 to a 5. 
because it went over a hot tub of water uh, called a loop current, very deep water, very much warmer than the surrounding water, and it just fed that hurricane, and then it arrived in New Orleans. By the time it got there, it was a three, and it made them uh, a landfall to, um, uh, and produce the kind of flooding that we see, uh, see here. Now, what happens to these systems when they start to move? Well, and this is what we're going to see with Hazel. We're going to see that about 50, more than 50% of these tropical storms, they're called fish storms. They kind of come northward, and then they just spin themselves out in the ocean. And don't cause any problem, don't sink a ship, doesn't make landfall. Hey, they just peter out and, and, and never to be remembered again, you say. Um, so, but almost a little less than half of them stay alive, and they begin to move northward. And then they combine with something else. They combine with a weather system that we're used to in the mid-Atlantic, you see, or in the mid-tropics, mid an extra-tropical kind of a system. So in that, and then some of them die. They just get together. They breed another, another storm, and then they just die out in the, in the Atlantic. Or that what happens, some of them then move northward and affect us, affect the land area of, of the United States or into, particularly into... Um, uh, into, uh, into Canada. So these things are called, um, um, as I say, post-tropical uh, depressions. They have fronts, they have the tropical humidity and moisture, but they have the dynamics of the warm front and the cold front. They're almost morphed into something that's different. It's, uh, they may not be quite as strong as a hurricane, but they've got other problems, you say. And a lot of the worry is the fact that these things, the public sees these things as, as kind of um, Oh, the hurricane's over. It's a post-tropical depression. Uh, they think it's it's no good. It's no big anymore. It's no 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 energy. There's not a, a problem with it. You see, and yet they can have a lot of moisture and strong winds and waves uh, associated with these uh, particular uh, systems. The, the generally what you see is the uh, and let's just imagine this tr this uh, uh, hurricane coming into Nova Scotia. And on the right-hand side is where the winds are going to be strong. And on the left side is where you're going to have the heavy rains. So there's actually a little bit uh, of a sorting out. You can have winds and rains on both sides, but generally the strongest winds are on the, on the right-hand side of the hurricane, and the rains are on the left side. Now, they can certainly cause um, all kinds of, um, of, of uh, waves, especially the waves on the, on the right-hand side, because the winds are blowing that way, and those wind-generated waves can be pretty, pretty strong. Probably one of the nastiest, uh, largest waves ever measured or, or recorded in, in the world was a hurricane, was a wind in, that hit the Queen Elizabeth II ocean liner just south of Newfoundland. In, um, it was Hurricane Lewis, or Louis, uh, however you pronounce that, um, back in, uh, in 1995. It was a 30 meter wave. The captain of the ocean liner said, oh my God, Coming right out of the darkness, like the white cliffs of Dover, was this vertical wave. And the only way to manage it is he surfed the wave and the ocean liner and, and just and, and survived, but it was damaged and it had to cripple into New York Harbor to repair the. I guess there wasn't dinner with the captain on that particular day. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a big one. Okay, let's move to the, the message at hand about her. <coughs> And what was 1954 like? It was kind of a normal year, hurricane-wise. There were about 11, um, 11 tropical storms, right on normal, named storms. Uh, there were eight hurricanes, maybe two more than you normally get, two severe ones, Hazel and, and also Carol. So that's about what you'd expect in an average kind of ho-hum ho kind of a, of a hurricane uh, a season. Now certainly Carol, uh, Dolly was a fish storm, didn't cause any problem. Carol and Edna, Carol early in September, and then Edna about the middle of September did cause a lot of damage. Carol, 61 deaths in the United States. Uh, Edna caused some problems in the Maritimes, took all the apples off the apple orchard, apple trees in Nova Scotia, killed one person, 160 uh, kilometer per hour winds in Yarma. So it's kind of a nasty blow. Now, Hazel was born, um, was the eighth tropical storm of the season, was the fourth hurricane. It was born early on October the 5th, um, about 150 kilometers uh, um, east of Granada in the Windward Islands. 
Now, everybody thought Hazel was going to die in the water because it moved so slowly. Five kilometers per hour. I mean, my gosh, it couldn't, you could walk faster than Hazel was moving. And so people thought that it would just suffocate. It would fall in on itself, you say, and would not be sustained. Could, you needed to rotate, move a little faster to be a, to be a force. But it stayed alive, you know. It, it, didn't, uh, it didn't die. And, um, and, and it began to drift aimlessly around the southern part of Jamaica. And then on, um, I've got to keep my maps here uh, sorted. Uh, and then uh, it finally, on the 12th, it sort of cut between Cuba and Haiti. But it made landfall in Haiti. It caused about 200 millimeters of rain. It caused 100,000 people to be uh, lose their homes. Uh, it was a nasty storm, killed 100 people, more than Hazel here in, in Haiti. And it, be, it was downgraded because over the rough terrain of the mountains of Haiti, it lost its fuel. As it came over the, the uh, Haiti and it got into the ocean again in the Gulf Stream, it got more, it got rejuvenated with more warm water. And then it, it buffeted and um, uh, uh, the Bahamas um, and, um, uh, and or heavy rains showered that area. And then it headed northeastward towards Georgia, or northwestward towards Georgia. And it, um, now, an important point, this is a very important element to understand what Hazel did here. And so let me, let me look at the, this is the weather map on just the, day, the, the moment that Hazel made landfall in, um, in Myrtle Beach. And two important systems I want you to look at. This high pressure area here and a front over here, okay? Because you see, hurricanes are lazy. They don't, they don't know where to move. They just spin their pirouette. They need to be held by the hand and guided, you see. Guided by the jet stream, by highs and lows on the weather map. They just sit there, and they would just sit there for a long time, and, wouldn't, and, and so they need to be shown the way. And so what you had here was a high pressure area here, which was blocking Hazel from moving out to the Atlantic and not being a threat. And then this low pressure area over here was attracting Hazel bringing it in inland. And we saw the same pattern with Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, a couple of years ago. Uh, a high pressure area here blocked Sandy's movement up here, and then all of a sudden you have this low pressure area over the Great Lakes, Toronto, Windsor area, and it, like a magnet, drew, uh, drew in Sandy, and it made a left-hand turn right through New York and New Jersey, and became the monster storm that it was. You see. So the same kind of weather setup had occurred there with Sandy as we saw with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with Hazel. So that's what we call the steering motion for a hurricane. They don't have their own. They look elsewhere for that uh, uh, that to occur. So here we have uh, uh, San uh, um, Hazel. It leaves the Bahamas. It becomes intensified. The winds pick up. Its forward speed picks up. It was going from 11 kilometers per hour to now 26 kilometers per hour. The pressure was dropping, 978 millibars to 934. It was like a bomb when it exploded, because the lower the pressure, the, the stronger the hurricane is, you say. It made landfall in, uh, which one do I press? Oh, this one. Um, um, it made landfall in Myrtle Beach, Cape Fear, in North Carolina, about, about dawn on that particular uh, morning on October the 15th. And it caused uh, a lot of damage. It, it killed 19 people. Hundreds of buildings were destroyed in the surf. The pier from 250 kilometers from either side of where it made landfall was heavily damaged in that particular uh, event. 200 to 275 millimeters of rain fell on um, uh, uh, North, uh, North Carolina and that, uh, that area and 19 people were killed in North Carolina. President Eisenhower called it a state of emergency in that particular uh, area. And then Hazel tracked northward. It stayed over land, came northward, and surprised a lot of forecasters that it didn't get downgraded. It stayed intact as a, as a hurricane. Because once over land, it's like turning off the thermostat. The thing dies, you say. And it didn't, it kept tracking, you say. And as it moved further northward, went through a, um, uh, 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 in Virginia, uh, it went between Washington and Baltimore, and headed into New York State and Pennsylvania. And so it was still alive. 
And now, it had been downgraded eventually. But it really, and a lot of the American meteorologists said this. Okay, it's going to be ripped apart in the Allegheny Mountains. And then it's going to move off to the east. Canadian meteorologists with the same models, the same uh, knowledge, the same bells and whistles, said, no, no. Its winds are going to die down, but it's heading northward, and it's going to come into Lake Ontario in um, about 9 or 10 o'clock in the evening. And that was the debate that went on between the Canadian meteorologists and the, and the American uh, uh, meteorologists. Um, okay, i got to find out where I am. All right. Here's Lambton House. I'm in Lambton House, thank you. Um, okay, so now as Hazel approached Toronto, Lake Ontario, it began to behave a little differently. Something was bothering it, and, and it was looking like it was being controlled by, by something else. And what it was, was in fact this weather system to the, to the this low pressure, or this, this cold front, this low pressure area to the west. Four days ago, it was centered north of Lake Superior. And on that morning at 2.30 in the morning on October the 15th, that system was right about here, and its cold front was trailing right down from that weather system, and it was crossing from Windsor to London to Toronto, and it finally, about 8.30 in the morning on October 15th, it stalled around Trent, stationary front. It had rained quite a bit, thunderstorms during the night, about 37 millimeters of rain in Toronto by about 7.30 in the morning, all from that storm, nothing from Hazel. Hazel was, hadn't even made landfall yet. And um, so it, it, it stalled right there. Typically, it would have moved on. No problem. But it stalled, and not only that, it backed up. It went backwards. Unbelievable. So Hazel came northward. It stayed together. It was downgraded, and that was, became Storm Hazel. People didn't call it Hurricane Hazel. By mid-afternoon, it was Storm Hazel. People went back to a normal living. It's over. Hurricane Hazel's not going to hit. It had all the moisture of Hurricane Hazel. It didn't have the strong winds. So as it came northward, it, about 9 o'clock, it was between Buffalo and Rochester. And then it came over Lake Ontario. Now, of course, it's not, I'm talking about the center, but the storm is a broad storm. So it's, all, it's moving in mass uh, northward, you see. And as it came northward, the cold front retreated from Trenton to actually between the downtown area of Toronto and the West End, maybe a little further out. That's where this front was. Hazel said, doesn't problem, no problem for me, I'm going to kick it out. So Hazel came northward, tried to push it out, couldn't, it was like a tug of war. So Hazel said, all right, I'm going to glide above it. So it lighter air, um, um, uh, warmer, lighter air, it went above this cold air. And that's when it exploded into a bomb. You had this incredible amount of rain. You had the thunderstorms in the cold front were all of a sudden been refueled. It's like supplying a plane in, 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 air, you know, in, in transit, you say. These uh, thunder clouds develop into monsters and you had this incredible deluge of rain as a result of this <coughs> merging together of this cold front and hazel. And, and, and that was the, the, uh, uh, the problem. And so hazel was moving northward about 80 kilometers per hour, and then it ran into this brick wall uh, like a sumo wrestler that wouldn't move, and it just went above it, and that's when all the action took place. Now look at here. This, this is a, um, a, a, an interesting... A picture. This is the weather between Toronto downtown and Malton. You had temperatures at Malton about this time, 11 degrees, 8 degrees at midnight, 17 degrees downtown. There was clearly, one was in the cold air, one was in the warm air. <laughs> the winds here at Malton, uh, west-southwest, back into northwest, 42 to 68 kilometers per hour. 19 kilometers light winds, northeast to east, different direction, different speed. Downtown and Mall. Uh, rains were letting up. In fact, here, between the two, 
if you were if you were standing there and just uh, looking up, you could see the stars. It was a starry sky between those two. It was like the eye of the of the hurricane. And so the contrast was that just showing you had a different world with terms of the weather right in the Toronto um, uh, uh, area. Now, um, by midnight, the storm was over. The rain had petered out about 2.30 in the morning. By 7.30, the storm hazel, which has now become sort of a kind of hazel two, I guess, it got rejuvenated with that cold front, was still together, it was raining in Sudbury. By noon, it was raining in Timmins. In fact, today, yesterday, Timmins, or today, Timmins, you know, yesterday, Timmins had its greatest October rainfall ever yesterday, in one day. The previous was Hurricane Hazel, back 60 years ago. So it went north, and then by the morning of the 17th, that Sunday morning, it was in James Bay and pretty well exhausted. And, um, and so, uh, let's talk about the weather office. What, were, what was life like in the weather office? Well, as you can imagine, it was absolutely drama. It was uh, an incredible situation with regards to what the pulling their hair out, talking about it. The, the meteorologist Fred Turnbull that uh, um, was mentioned earlier was making forecasts uh, at this time. He was in consultation with the uh, Montreal office, where we called the Central Analysis Office, where we had a supercomputer. Yeah, back then, 1954. It was about the power of a Nintendo game. <laughs> Nothing from it. But the experience there and the meteorologist in Toronto talking back and forth, trying to get the forecast out, and, um, and so there was a lot of, a lot of activity. Uh, they drew maps, they plotted maps by hand, they drew them by hand, and they would discuss what the situation was going to be, and they got the forecast out. They would get the forecast, they talked to the police, to the firemen, to the politicians, to different agencies. They got marine forecasts out. Miraculously, not one ship on the Great Lakes was even damaged by Hurricane Hazel because of the timely forecasts that were issued from the Malton uh, weather, uh, weather Office. And, uh, of course, what really concerned Fred Turnbull, and he was on the phone, uh, radio, and newspapers, and, and he said, it's the rain, stupid, it's the rain. People thought that the rain had come to an end at 7 o'clock. He said, no, the worst is yet to come, you say. And it just couldn't drive that point into the people in Toronto because people didn't know what that rain would do. Um, how, what kind of a flood <coughs> would you get from that kind of a, of a rain? So, in fact, um, they were busy as, as bees. And, and let me tell you, I, I did a, um, about 20 years ago, I talked to one of the forecasters. And I did an oral history for our service. And I talked to him, and let me read you uh, what he said to me. Because he was on the desk forecasting during that day of October 15th. His name was John Knox, well-known meteorologist in Canada. And this is what he said in his words. There was a lot of real drama in the weather office. First of all, the forecasting of that storm was extremely well handled by the Malton office. Ewart Johnson was the first forecaster to anticipate that there was some chance that the Lake Ontario region would be affected ultimately by the storm. That was 48 hours before. That was the storm that was just buffeting Bahamas, 2,000 kilometers away. And this guy, with no models, just a sense of, of what, what would happen, had it right. He said it would be in that evening in Lake Ontario on the, the evening of October 15th. The winds would die down, but the rain would be, uh, would be heavy. Now the forecaster on that shift, midnight to 8 in the morning, was Norman Grundy. And he predicted that the center of the storm would cross the central part of Lake Ontario that evening as a very vigorous storm. I followed on the public shift. This is John Knox. He started at 8 o'clock in the morning on that fateful day. And um, we got those warnings out pretty early that day. We pulled out all the stops about it being heavy rain and strong winds, lots of drama. Now, I went off shift about 5 o'clock in the evening. Fred, that's Fred Turnbull, stayed right on because of the gravity of the situation. I remember Fred Gardner, the Metro Toronto the Metro chairman, phoned Fred Turnbull that evening, nonplussed as to what to do because there was no infrastructure in position with regard to controlling the flow of water. There were people in the prediction system, there were, I'm sorry, there were no people in the prediction business of hydrology flow. And to the burden of what was going to happen, after the rain fell on the whole watershed, 
was to the weather office. All we could do was simply say how much rain was going to fall. Gardner had no idea what to do. Fred gave him some advice with regards to bridges and access points and, and where, to his knowledge, things would really be dangerous. The interesting thing was that the storm moved through very rapidly. The next morning was a beautiful day. I was listening to CKEY at home. It was a Saturday, my day off. And Mickey Lester was a very, in a very grave voice talking about the enormous number of casualties that resulted from the flooding of the Humber River. I was shocked when I heard about it. The flood press came down and wiped out all those homes. In spite of the warnings, a lot of people didn't get out, and they were just drowned. It shook all of us up. And then there were a lot of, lot of talk about the forecast office. There was some people were praising the forecast, others were denouncing it. Some people said it was the best kept secret in town. It was the, it, it's the fact that it didn't get out. Of course, there's very few avenues of vehicles to get the forecast. There's no internet, there's no television at that time. And so how do you warn the puppy? public about a time when, uh, when this was, uh, was occurring. But based on the sciences and services of the forecast office in 1954, the public was well served by that. Um, and um, as I say, we got it 24 hours before it made landfall and, um, and got its uh, speed and, uh, and everything. So let me look at, um, at, at some of the, um, at the rainfall and the flooding that occurred. The rainfall was huge. Um, in Toronto and Pearson, 121 millimeters on the 15th. Over the 48 hours, about 156 uh, millimeters of rain. I think I have a, a, a table here. Downtown Toronto, about 104 millimeters in the 48 hour period on the 14th, 15th, and a couple of hours on the 16th. We see Brampton, 212, Bradford. Snell Grove, northwest of the, of the city, had the greatest amount of rain. 214 millimeters of rain in that period. Now we also have um, um, uh, what we call unofficial, where we do a bucket survey. We go where they don't have a rain gauge, but they might have had a trough, a rain barrel that was empty, and then we would look at the rain and see and do the geometry of it and say, well, how much rain would have fallen if there had been a rain gauge there? And we see at Bolton, 275 millimeters, Nobleton, 225. This was the greatest amount of rain that Toronto had, and we had 100 millimeters back in 1888. So this was a lot of rain that the city was getting uh, and um, at this uh, particular uh, uh, time. And then, but the thing is, it was the, what I call the antecedent precipitation. It was a precipitation that occurred prior to, to Hazel. From August 1st to October the 14th, there was maybe 85% more precipitation occurred than normal. For that two weeks into October, from October 1st to October 14th, you had a month and a half of rain. The ground couldn't take any. It was like a sponge. The rivers were engorged with water at a time when conditions were usually dry, you see. And then you had this monster storm that dumped all, I mean, 90% of the rainfall got into the rivers. Nothing could percolate into the ground. And that immediate response of so much rain running overland, um, just uh, it, the, 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 the system couldn't take. You remember last year that, um, uh, a, a few figures here, I've already told you those, um, remember that storm July 8th in Toronto? Um, a lot of things were made about the fact that it was heavier rain than Hurricane Hazel. 126 millimeters of rain in two hours, Hazel had 121 in, in 24 hours. You see. But they were two different systems. Um, the, the Hazel was a much broader area, it was really an Ontario kind of storm, not just the Humber River. And, um, and this was a thunderstorm rain, Hazel was a river flood, a river flood. And, and I think that's, uh, that's important to, uh, to realize that. And let's look at the river flow. I, I just, it takes a lot for me to shake my head. And when you look at the river flow, that truly is where the story is. All this rain that fell had to go somewhere. And we're talking often about, in the, the, the great things about the rivers in, in Toronto, is there's quite a drop from the Oak Ridges moraine down to the lake shore. I mean, for 300 and almost 350 meters. So that water, once it gets in, can cascade, can barrel down those uh, those rivers and creeks uh, in the in the Toronto area. So when you look at what happened, 
on that particular occasion in the, the stream flow in the, in the Humber. It was like a freshwater tsunami, in a way. All this water came barreling down from the headwaters and right into the Humber River, 90 billion liters of water fell on that, or came down the river in that particular moment. You had, in fact, in one hour, the water levels rose six meters on, on, on Humber. You had incredible wave heights of five to seven meters on the Humber River. I mean, that would be a big ocean wave, let alone a river, an, an, an urban river for, for wave. You had, in fact, the current of that water was 48 kilometers per hour. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't get near it without it sweeping you away, usually. and everything in it so packed. So it was a huge amount of rain in a short period of time, and engorged that river, and of course we saw the form force of it. Now, more, more have been probably written about Hurricane uh, Hazel uh, than any other uh, weather event, for good reason. Uh, also, it was, as they say, north of the city in an area, and there's a fi uh, film clip out here, or a video clip if you want to see the destruction in the Holland Marsh, uh, north of uh, Toronto. And, um, and it, was, it was big. I mean, there were 3,000 people that had been evacuated from their homes. The earthen dike had uh, failed. And there was um, uh, mostly uh, Dutch families that were uh, gardening or were uh, growing uh, uh, material, uh, uh, vegetables and, and crops up there. There was that one family, the Deputer family, uh, had moved from Holland in '53 to get away from the floods <laughs> and came to Toronto in '54 with the big flood. And they, their house was dislodged from the foundation. They had 12 children in that house. And they were, the house was floating in the water, spinning around about midnight, it got dislodged, floating around in, in what was a river or a marsh turned lake, careening off other houses and, and posts. The children would run from side to side as the, as the house would list in the one. They'd run to the other side and balancing, climbed up on the roof. Hey, nobody would lost their life. They were rescued uh, in, the, in the morning. But that was, uh, uh, we saw, of course, in, in um, uh, in Woodbridge, uh, we saw um, uh, flooding there, took out an earthen dam. The first deaths from Hazel occurred about 11 o'clock at night up in, uh, in the Woodbridge area. You know, the final tally, I don't want to, as I say, go into this. Uh, we, we see this is a, a not necessarily numbers that can be verified, but clearly it was 4,000 people in Ontario that were homeless, 2,000 in Toronto. 81 deaths, they weren't all in the Humber River, there were others in other parts of, uh, of Ontario, and, um, but uh, a lot of uh, damage, and of course. So let me move to sort of my kind of observations, concluding kind of observations about Hazel, and what we learned from it, and, and what, how things have changed over that period of, um, of time. Well, first of all, the, the meteorology. You know, in many ways, and I think I'm exaggerating this, and we always talk about the perfect storm, in many ways this was the first of the perfect storms. We had all of that antecedent precipitation. The well was primed. And then you had this, this incredible combination of this cold front uh, marrying uh, Hazel right over Toronto, and, and, and you had hell broke loose. If Hazel had been by itself, probably 50 millimeters of rain, it would have been some wind damage, it would have been the tag end of a hurricane, and we've seen a couple of those. We saw them in Agnes and Isabel and, and Fran. There have been other moments like this, and, and so it would have been you know, just another wet Friday night in Toronto. That storm system, that cold front, if it had just been by itself, it would have been maybe um, some severe thunderstorms. There would have been some isolated, uh, uh, very um, brief kind of rainfall events and would have been, I always say, the best thing about Canadian weather, it hits and runs. It just hits and runs and you clean up begins a few hours later. Well, it was this fact that they stood their ground and you had that interplay, uh, Storm uh, uh, Agnes, or some people call it Agnes II, uh, it, it, it created the, the, the issue of was. We also, as I say, it wasn't just a Humber River event. Uh, we saw, for example, in the Grand River, of, uh, near Kitchener and, and uh, in, in the uh, Kitchener area, where heavy rains, over 200 people had to be uh, rescued by boat. There was in Hamilton, up in Barrie, up in Kitchener Waterloo, in the Guelph area, there had been um, um, uh, cave ins, there had been uh, landslides and fallen trees and blocked roads and, 
and filled underpasses. Uh, even in South Hampton, there was a train wreck, this is in the picture from it, where it killed two, uh, two firemen. Uh, in Beaton, Ontario, uh, there was in fact, um, uh, again, not from the Beaton area, uh, it was uh, uh, two cars swept off the bridge, and sadly, when you read it, it just brings a tear to your eye, is that these people were within inches of being rescued, and then, and then pulled away by the current, and, and didn't make it. I think in many ways, looking back 60 years ago, that few were concerned because this was not hurricane territory. Um, this was something that was foreign to this area. There had been a hurricane, there was a famous hurricane in 1900 called the Galveston Hurricane. Uh, killed um, killed 8 to 12,000 people. And they were fishing bodies that more than fish out of the Gulf of Mexico in that storm. That storm came into Ontario and killed about 100 people. But that was 1900. People had forgotten. We kind of know in weather that seven years after the event, you kind of, you're not as worried, right? you don't have the anxiety after the, the event. It takes about seven years of non-activity to kind of get over that, that kind of, uh, of event. So certainly it wasn't something that was common in this area. People went to bed that night thinking that, hey, it was just, you know, a bit of power outages, a few flooded basements and intersections, but no big deal. Been raining since August the 1st. Um, um, it was this area of the Humber River, no flood. Spring flood. It's about snow melt and ice jam and April showers. In the fall time of year, this is when the water levels are the lowest. This is when you need to refill the groundwater. To the streams are usually the water flow is the slope. So people just didn't think about flooding at this particular time, and nobody had really any sense of the hydrometeorology of the climate. The forecast office could get the rainfall. But who was going to take that rainfall and translate it into a flood? Nobody. There was no, inf there was no bureaucracy set up to do that. The conservation authorities existed, but they were just about planting trees and, and, and restoring ecological habitats. There was nothing about flood forecasting in their particular uh, mandate, usually. And, um, and then, of course, um, um, uh, we also saw 60 years ago, the media was caught off guard. You know, I mean, the media, the morning newspaper called for showers that day. And, and it was no big deal. Now, of course, if there was an event like that, you'd have, you know, uh, Peter Mansbridge dressed in a yellow sou'wester standing in the Humber River saying, um, you know, uh, don't stand in the water. Uh, or, or Anderson Cooper doing the same thing, you could say. Uh, and, of course, they know that it beats... Seinfeld and Simpsons in the ratings every night. It's what I call storm porn. It's this notion, you see, that we love to see wild and wacky weather, and, and it's, we don't want to wish death on people and injuries, but my God, it's the awesome power of nature, you see. And, and, and they, the media love it. I've had media phone me and say, well, um, I'll say, I've got some good news. The uh, hurricane has been downgraded from a three to a one. They said, what do you mean our satellite trucks haven't even left yet, you said. <laughs> so, hey, there is that, that, that severe weather can, can seduce us, for sure. But also, Toronto had changed in 54. It wasn't muddy York anymore. They had wooden sidewalks were going. Dirt parking lots were a thing of the past. The idea was to pave over, you said. And, and uh, the more asphalt and cement and building materials you could spread, the more modern you were, and the less dirty you became when you were splashed by, uh, by a passing in my court. So there was this idea to, to, to bring it on, to make it a world-class city, and so there was this, this no hesitation to try and waterproof the city with, uh, with some kind. And I always say, you know what? When you rain on a cement parking lot or a city, and 50% of Toronto is, is cement and asphalt, that raindrop becomes a flood drop. doesn't matter how dry the city is, it becomes a, an issue. Now, I also think, there's several authors who say, as I, I truly agree, that in many ways, Hurricane Hazel transformed Toronto. It, it changed. It was almost our Katrina, in a way. 
There was an opportunity to do things do differently. And, and you know, our municipal leaders at the time, provincial leaders, were so enlightened. <coughs> they were hit hard. But they decided to do something about it, and at very great cost, you say. And so, so there were issues with this. Uh, at that time, river valleys were, were filled with homes. They, it was the answer to the, the housing problem in Toronto was build them in the ravines. Cut down the trees and allow development to take place. And, um, and, and forget flood control and catchment. It was about um, the post-war boom and, hey, every square inch of territory was, uh, was free, uh, free, free rent. Um, well, there was, a, as I say, in the ten years prior to that, there was, in fact, um, I don't know where I am, and I don't mean to see, there was a, a conservation authority that permitted municipalities to form a, a conservation authority, but it was really took Hazel to inspire that revolution in, in floodplain management. And, and ruthless, as they, some people may say it was, they came in there and they said, okay, you shall not develop the floodplain that you will, uh, people were bought out, maybe they weren't given fair market price, but they certainly were bought out, and this area, these rivers of uh, uh, valleys of Toronto became uh, public parks and uh, for all to enjoy at all seasons. And I think that that is to me one of the legacies of, of Hurricane Hayes. So I think those 81 people, they didn't die without uh, uh, at least some good that came from this this terrible uh, nasty storm to where we have today recognized as one of the best uh, interconnected parkways uh, park systems in the world in an urban setting and so so I think we can we can thank uh, uh, our, our people at that time now let me let me quickly look at um, at the uh, the forecast office because there have been some changes there and certainly um, the um, the only regret I think people have was downgrading it from hazel hurricane hazel to storm hazel. I think that sort of cut people became more more oblivious to the threat that it uh, it brought. Now certainly forecasting has changed over that time. They didn't have satellites back then. They have satellites now. I mean, the oceans can't burp without us knowing about it now. You see, so any storm that develops in this planet, we're going to see because of satellites. They didn't have, they had radar, but not operational radar. It wasn't used in the weather office. No supercomputers. And so I often wonder how those guys like Percy Saltzman got it right so often back then. I mean, all he had was chalk. You see? And, and, and yet they could get it right uh, for so, so often, you say. So as I say, no supercomputer. Uh, and, um, and what we have now is a very good relationship with the uh, we have our own Canadian Hurricane Center. They're busy as beavers right now because of, of the Gon, Gonzalo. Or Gonzalo is a hurricane that's about to hit the Maritimes. So they, I can tell you, they're very busy up there, and uh, and they have good relationships with the National Hurricane Center in Miami, sharing advice and, and training, and, and it's a good connection. Uh, we also, in fact, uh, have better recognition or re relationships with our partners, with people in the uh, conservation authorities, providing the information so people can take that meteorological data and translate it into, in fact, uh, information that can be useful in saving lives and, uh, and property. And so, so that certainly has changed. Now, could hazel occur again? Most certainly. Uh, there's nothing to suggest, even maybe even in a more powerful way, these flashy thunderstorms are occurring more often. So, you know, we may see certainly the, uh, that, that's, a, that's a possibility. And, um, but I don't think from an from a, a environmental uh, destruction um, that would be possible. I think that we've got better infrastructure in place. Uh, we understand more of the systems. There's no gaps in terms of translating that weather information into hydrologic information. So I think we're, we're certainly better off. And we saw that in July 8th. I mean, a nasty storm, heavy amounts of rain, but no lives were lost, no injuries. And so, you know, we as Canadians, I think our strength as Canadians is that we are respectful of nature. We always seem to do the right thing. We, we don't have a general country in terms of weather, but we always seem to, because you experience a lot of it, you kind of know what to do. You know how to take advantage of it. Now let me just wind up with one comment or two about hurricanes and, and climate change. Um, I think that generally the feeling is uh, more speculative and anecdotal evidence 
the hurricanes we see on the planet, there's not more of them, but they seem to be a little bigger, wider geographically, and more intense. There are more category three, fours, and fives than there used to be. So that could be, but again, that's not scientifically uh, uh, verified. It's just uh, a suggestion, and we've seen uh, year in, year in, and year out evidence of that. There's clearly no individual tropical storm can be tied to climate change. People tried to do that with Katrina. They said, oh my gosh, this storm, it came out of our tailpipes and smokestacks. No, 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 no. It was there. There have been more powerful hurricanes than Katrina that have hit New Orleans. What had, did change was the land use. That has changed. I think that has even changed more than the weather. The fact that that bayou had been developed on with uh, pavement and asphalt and buildings and that, and then when Hazel or when uh, Katrina hit, it caused a big ticket, uh, ticket item. So what we are seeing, you see in the recent economic impacts that we're seeing from these tropical storms, from these hurricanes, is because we're wealthier. We've removed that green, nature's green infrastructure. We've, we've taken it away and built outer islands and, and condos and, and great development. And so then when these things hit, we wonder, oh my gosh, how unfair is it, do you say? And of course, there's more damage, more destruction, and, uh, and, and in fact, those, those green infrastructure was there to withstand, be a buffer uh, for some of those nasty uh, events, and, and we got away from that. There's also a certain thing called um, a, a, um, a cycle with hurricanes. There's a multi-decadal variability. We know that there are quiet periods and active periods with hurricanes. We find we're in about a 20 to 30 year cycle of an active period. Since 1995 to now, there have been more hurricanes in the North Atlantic than any other time in its history. And indeed, uh, in, that, in that, how many years since 1915, almost 20, there were only three years where we had below the normal number of hurricanes. That was last year, and uh, I think 2000, I've written it down here, uh, 2000 and, um, well, I can't find it, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So three years out of 20, where it's been fewer than normal, and all the ones have been more. I mean, not, not last year, but three previous years, each one had 19 tropical storms, where you normally get about 11. So it's been active from that point of view. We also know that when you warm it up, the atmosphere holds more moisture. And so therefore, there's a greater chance you're going to realize more rain. For every one degree warming, the atmosphere holds 7% more moisture. So the fact that we warmed up, you should expect this to occur. And even a little bit of wind can cause a lot of damage. A 10% increase in wind can cause a 60% increase in damage. So even just marginally increasing the power and the energy of these systems, a little bit more moisture for rain and a little bit stronger winds can create enormous amount of damage from these particular winds. And then finally, we also know that when the water levels of the oceans have risen, and they have. And why have they risen? Not because of ice cap melting, or, or uh, it's been because when you warm up the water, it expands. And so the oceans have risen. So these same storms, even keep the storms not even more energetic, the same storms will cause more higher water to inundate further. And so one would expect more of that. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
and went into, in effect, Brazil. Brazilians claim it was, but, North, but American meteorologists claim that it wasn't. So a bit of controversy, but clearly there's zero. There's no now. And I think the water temperatures could be colder. That could be a reason. But um, it, it also is the fact that um, uh, the wind structure, the fact that there's more ocean than the land, believe it or not, that may also be a factor. But it really is inactive. It really is, uh, it's mostly confined to the north. And I think the thing that's driving that are more water temperatures, uh, warmer waters appearing in the northern hemisphere, more ocean waters. Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering, from your vivid and loving descriptions of the eyes of hurricanes, are you a storm chaser? Have you ever? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I'm not a storm chaser. I'm smart, too smart to, uh, to chase storms. I'll leave that to people who, uh, who kind of know what to do. I've always had sort of like, though, an urge to get in one of those reconnaissance aircraft and fly through. Uh, but then I'm thinking, no, no, I think when it came right down to it, I'd have my parachute on and I would just bail at the last uh, moment. And there have been, I mean, they, they, they really, everything's tied down. You can imagine what it's like flying in those, in those reconnaissance aircraft through that storm wall. There have been occasions where planes have never come back. They've been lost uh, in that. And uh, so it's risky. There is, though, a squadron of hurricane hunters uh, in the United States that all they do is fly in reconnaissance and they fly and they drop these, these uh, instruments called drop sounds to, to measure the the, the three-dimensional uh, characteristics of that. And the information is sent right back into the models, plugged into the models. And so um, uh, these things are, are well instrumented by, by ocean waves, by ocean um, uh, buoys, but by also aircraft, satellites. I mean, that's, and that's why the forecasting of these things, of these storms, has improved dramatically um, in terms of you can see them coming you know, days in advance. And I often wonder, you know, some people think, you know, that's the problem. You know, we're worrying for a whole week about this thing. We're boarding up. And, and, you know, it doesn't really happen so much in our territory because, as I say, you know, these storms hit and run. So they, they normally uh, will uh, move on pretty, pretty quickly. But in the United States, in, in Florida, in the Caribbean, sometimes these storms will make a direct hit. Sometimes they will stop and then pirouette around and torment you and tease you and back up and move back in, hit you twice. So it must be really, from an anxiety point of view, it must be uh, pretty, pretty elevated. And, um, but, but no, I, I think, you know, as I get older, I don't think I would venture. That's not in my bucket list to uh, <laughs> go on those Any other questions? How far does these things fly up to uh, do the reconnaissance? You know, essentially, it really they they focus on the eye. They go into the eye, the roughest part of the hurricane, because that's really they they have a, a pretty good and and that's where really all of the, the the energy is. That's where the convective processes are taking place, and they can plug that into and then then their models will be able to look at the other weather systems and the size of it and factor that in. So it really is flying into that. That I Can you imagine? I think if you were flying there, you'd probably go to the bathroom in the when you were in the eye of the hurricane to get ready for the for the next half hour when you would fly into the the back end of that uh, that eye wall. So so really, that's um, they, they really concentrate and they would do it several times, at several elevations, at several they altitudes. Go as far as Leeward Island. Or, or oh, the distance. Yeah. Oh, I see. I, I know the, 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 the one air base is in New Orleans, um, but they, they really can go quite a distance. And, um, and they wouldn't just take any, any kind of storm to go into. It would be one where it was a little bit more threatening, um, it was more organized. Um, it would be something about it that would drive them to it uh, and to, to, to monitor the conditions inside that hurricane. Are you ready? Next. Thank you. Really enjoyed the, the talk and the presentation of facts and also your enthusiastic way in the anecdotal stories. All a very good presentation. Um, when you, I'm uh, thinking more of Toronto, you were making compliments uh, in terms of what has been learned about Hurricane Hazel. That's my general sense that they're, they're the whole way of the city, getting people out of the floodplain, all those things have been good practices. Um, one thing it seems to me, and I'm not that familiar, 
Because when we started having over the last handful of years, the Don Valley Parkway and various volumes like that, they're all like, oh, I don't have that memory of it. So there, and there seems to be a certain frequency. So as you say, there has been some knowledge gained by the bodies uh, the, to make decisions based on that and the hydrology and such. It strikes me maybe more has to be done, and I know that's not your domain, but do you have any recommendations in that realm, or maybe so like Toronto or any other places? Because as you say, maybe this might increase somewhat because of some of the factors that you described earlier. Well, thank you. That's a very well articulated question. I appreciate that. You know, one little point I would raise is that one of the other legacies that I didn't mention from Hazel, it became the design storm for Ontario. So that uh, many communities, whether it was Timmins or Windsor or Sarnia, um, they, they, after Hazel occurred, they had to build their infrastructure to withstand an event like Hazel. So the fact that it occurred, I think, provided a lot of, um, a lot of good uh, engineering information for communities in Ontario. But we also know that we've been exceeded by Hazel. And so there's the interesting thing, and you raised the Don Valley, and we see that in a Toronto area, in a recent 15-year period for, for Toronto. Um, we saw um, uh, six um, or, or three 100-year three events in 15 years, three 100-year events, and 60 50-year events. So that we know these 100-year events don't just occur once every hundred years, I'm saying. And you know, people get seduced into that. They think, oh my gosh, I've just survived the storm of the century and I have 99 more years to go. <laughs> hey, it doesn't work that way. And what we're seeing in Toronto is the fact that um, even though our general climate hasn't changed, we're still a cold and, and snowy and we have four seasons and, and we can get the spent hurricane here and there. Uh, we realize that what has changed are the statistics of weather. The fact that storms seem to be stormier, you see, a little bit more intense. They seem to last a little longer. And that's having an impact on our infrastructure. And that's why we're seeing things like the Don Valley is it's flooded every time there seems to be a major uh, rain event. <coughs> My hope is that people are paying attention to that. And I think certainly in the bureaucracy of Toronto, they are, whether it's being translated up the pipe to, uh, to people willing to do something about it is a... Uh, but I certainly know the uh, conservation authorities, people, the engineers, the city planners are well aware of those kinds of changes and, um, and clearly are trying to do things not to prevent it. I mean, this is the thing about climate or weather. You can't, all the blowing you do doesn't stop that storm from coming your way. But by planning and doing things differently, and accepting it and realizing that that event is going to come, then you can cushion the blow. You can prevent it from becoming a disaster. The hazard is going to be there, but you can, you can and not just sort of grin and bear it and say, well, you know, you might as well just accept it, it's going to come. No, 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 you can do things differently in a 25 cent way and also a multi-million dollar way to, to cushion that kind of blow. And I think it's a matter of making people knowledgeable in the Toronto area of, of the fact that the weather is changing and that it's not just the same old, same old. Uh, uh, I often preach the fact that don't do what your grandparents did or your teachers told you to do, because the situation has changed. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sam, just a small one on to that. As you know, there's a couple of other things. Just, just to build on? Just to build on? No, okay. The gentleman at the back, I think there's somebody at the back here has their hand up next. Yes? Yeah, uh, you had an image that I think you described as hazel, but it looked like we were looking straight down. Uh, was that a... A radar image, or was it? No, it wasn't Hazel. I'm sure it uh, wasn't Hazel. There was no, there were no sat satellites. Yeah. Came about six to ten years later. Right. So I apologize for that. And I should have made that point at the beginning that not all of these slides are connected. I was showing slides to create a mood in terms of hurricanes and eyes and things like that. But no, there, there was, there were no shots of the Hazel storm itself. Okay, and one more question: What person behind hasn't asked the gentleman? Um, as you mentioned earlier, the conservation authorities have worked into a 100-year storm uh, flood control line for some years, probably since Hazel, is that correct? I think it is. Yes. And now they're looking at two to 300 years. Are they? Do you think that is reasonable? Yeah, or is 100 years kind of a reasonable probability of protecting property and, and life and so on? Well, you know, I think it would just cost billions of dollars to protect yourself from everything that nature is going to give you. You know, you have to be a cutoff. You have to accept the fact that you're going to be flooded out. And that's why we see a different 
uh, uh, design criteria in cities as opposed to suburban areas and rural areas. You don't mind being flooded out a little bit more often in the suburban areas than you do in the downtown area. So I, I you know, I don't know the answer to that. I think that uh, uh, certainly, um, uh, if it's if the 300-year storm is being used as a design criteria, whether that's being implemented may be another issue. It may be the design storm, but maybe they're taking something less than that. I'm not quite sure. I'm going to take one more question. Sandy Berdecki did our Hurricane Hazel talk last year and works with Dave at Environment Canada. So come on, Sandy. <laughs> the design storms aren't for 100 years. They're not for 100? No, they're 25. They're 25, okay. Um, doesn't it vary, though, Sandy, depending upon the, um, whether it be a built-up area or a, a... Well, mostly the cities did the 25-year storms. Um, they don't want to spend that kind of money for outside the farm area or outside the big city. But the design storms are based on 25 because of the cost. Okay. Now, you'll, if you have a 50-year, then the insurance is going to come. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll end the questions now because we're getting a bit late, and um, I will. Let me go this way. Um, I'd like to thank Dave very much. Interesting, informative. I think everybody here was spellbound from the entire uh, talk, which was wonderful. Thank you.